Welcome to the Animation Industry Podcast. My name is Terry, and every morning I sit by the lake with my dog, Moose, and we watch the sailboats go by. This chat is with Ryan Summers, a veteran motion designer who was just topped as senior creative director at the creative studio Spilt. Over his career, Ryan has worked on projects for Warner Brothers, Starbucks, Pokemon, and Google. And in our chat, he's going to share how to put together a portfolio to get yourself hired in motion design. But first, there's something really cool coming up, and that is the Stop Motion event of the year is back in person this September. Festival Stop Motion Montreal returns to the big screen at Concordia University's J.A. de Serve Theatre from September 16th to 18th, which is coming up super soon. 75 of the top short films in stop motion cinema from around the world were selected to compete this year across 10 different screening programs for the coveted Ball and Socket Trophy Awards. And I have one of these coveted Ball and Socket Trophy Awards from two years ago. Now there's gonna be special guest conferences, exhibitions, meet the filmmakers, networking opportunities, and so much more to check out. VIP passes are on sale now. Visit stopmotionmontreal.com for more info. And now, without further ado, let's jump into the chat. Hi, Ryan. Thanks for coming on the chat. How are you doing? I'm doing awesome. I'm super excited. I've just listened to, I think, four or five episodes back to back to back on oh, a wow. car ride. So I'm, uh, I'm I'm ready to go. I'm very excited. Uh, I want to talk animation. So you, <laughs> so you already know me and you already know how this is going to go. Uh, yes. <laughs> Well, you know, um, why, why did you want to come on this chat? I'm just interested because, you know, you have a lot of motion yeah. design and graphics experience and, and you also ran a podcast yourself with School of Motion. So uh, wh why are you coming on this chat? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, first off, um, I love talking animation, right? I can't get enough of it. Um, so I'm already listening to the show, but um, I think uh, your show is one of the few, if not maybe the only one I know of that that equivocates motion design and animation as kind of like equals, you know, yeah. like a lot of times there are, there are shows, podcasts, YouTube channels that sit just in motion design. And then there's a lot of shows, you know, like the Baxter brothers, there's all kinds of great shows that are animation focused, whether it's TV or film. Um, but the line for some reason doesn't cross that much, even though I see them as like kind of cut from the same cloth. Like there's a lot of, uh, we use a lot of the same tools. The the 12, you know, the principles are, are pretty much the same. Um, we have a lot of the same heroes. We watch the same movies and TV shows. So like, I just thought it would be a really great time to talk. Um, I, I mean, yeah, a hundred percent. You know, it's it's so funny how animation is already a niche industry, but we even categorize it in its own niches. Like motion, yeah. even explainer videos are like nobody even thinks of that when you when it comes to animation. But that's a huge business as well. Yeah. Like every every corporation has explainer videos going on on their website mm -hmm. and behind the scenes. But like nobody, every when you think of animation, you think of TV and movies mm -hmm. and Pixar and Disney, and you don't think of T the tons of money that's spent on these other areas in animation but for yeah. me as long as it's moving and you're making it move yeah that's animation to me like like it doesn't matter <laughs> you're, you're asking yourself the same questions like when i set a key here or i draw a drawing here how many drawings go in between and how far apart exactly. do i set them to get the mood or the tone of the, so they're all it, it's all the same like it doesn't matter what the tools are that that is the one thing i love about animation is like you can put as much technology as you want to on top of it but you could still have literally like a bunch of post-it notes and something drawn them and you can flip these things and that's animation 100%. and whatever you learn there 20 years later you'll still have that you know knowledge whatever you use it could be yeah i think i think i'm gonna ask you some interesting questions because uh well why don't we just start with this one so yeah. in tra traditional animation you know <laughs> disney pixar yeah. television movies you know the main thing is you tell a story through animation mm -hmm. and you tell something that's unique and you share it with motion graphics you know what is the story you're essentially telling other than fancy, uh, smooth movements. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so I, I will go back and say that I, I, I feel like, and this could be controversial. I get in a lot of trouble with people because a lot of people say motion design isn't really an industry. It's just a collection of tools hmm. or they say motion design is just animation for advertising. And I, I scoff at that. I laugh at that. I don't think that's true. I think that motion design actually is kind of like a philosophy or a way of thinking or way of working because so many of the jobs are smaller and quicker and they don't have um, a robust pipeline or robust yeah. workflow that's repeatable all the time, right? You don't walk into a shop, even the biggest motion design shops, and it doesn't have 200 people all with like heads of each department with like a plaque on their door that you have to knock. Like, it's kind of like any three people could be thrown together and they have to do seven to eight to 10 shots for a 30 second thing and they have to figure out how to do it. 
And that comes with negatives, but in a lot of ways, it also creates a lot of ownership. And I think it also, um, it creates a way of thinking about animation and moving things that's very different from, I have to do my in-betweens and then somebody else, or I have to do my keys and someone else is going to do my in-betweens or I'm going to you know, design the character and someone else is going to animate it. There's a, just a different like philosophy, even though we share a lot of the same history and the same tools. So I, I don't even think of um, animation necessarily if in the purest form as just like storytelling. I think it's problem solving. You do mm. at, at its core thing. At, at, at most people work in animation don't even get to talk about storytelling outside of their individual shot, right? Like I have a lot of friends, my best friend's an animator, he worked at Disney's, worked at DreamWorks, and it's, it's a luxury to get a sequence as a feature animator who only has to do three to five seconds a week of animation, it's a luxury to get like eight shots strung together, right? Where you can actually do storytelling. That comes from the supervisors, from the storyboard, from the layout people, it, it's a team effort. Um, so in that way, it's even in my mind, even a step below that is that animation, no matter how you do it, is problem solving. And motion design is a thousand percent that, whether it's in the motion, whether it's creating the energy, creating the vibe, figuring out what tool to use, what pipeline, um, how to talk to the client that's saying what they want when it's probably not the right thing. All of those things to me end up just being like, it's artful problem solving. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe let's, let's roll it back just a little bit and, and talk about where things began for you. You know, mm -hmm. you're obviously a quite experienced guy when it comes to this whole area and, and where did, you know, how did things start for you? Cause I, I think I read somewhere that you were originally a chem in chemical engineering. <laughs> I feel like that might be another <laughs> Which I guess reason is problem I solving. That. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like that might be another reason why I wanted to be on this show, because it seems somewhat similar to your path as well, where you didn't start as an artist, you know, in animation, just at 18 year olds going to, you know, to school and just doing it. Yeah. Um, I was a chemical engineer. I came from the south side of Chicago. I was lucky enough to kind of be born in the year Star Wars came out and live in the 80s when it was basically like video games, comic books, animation, TV shows, movies. It just you got there's a reason I think why the world looks the way it does now, like pop culture is culture because everybody that was born in the late seventies and early eighties is now making all this stuff. And that's the thing that's most important to them. Um, but I never thought there's this, I didn't think there's an industry, right? You know, like I saw Toy Story, Jurassic Park, Nightmare Before Christmas, uh, Iron Giant. And I still didn't realize like something I could do where I was from. Yeah. Um, and I, I went to school for chemical engineering for almost two years. And a guy in a computer lab saw me drawing when I was supposed to be doing something else. He's like, pulled me aside. He, I think he was like the IT guy that ran the lab. He's like, Hey, I'm going to teach this class. And it was 3D Max. It was before it was 3D. Or no, it was 3D Studio. It was before it was 3D Studio Max. It was on DOS, if anybody remembers 3D that. 3D pre... Studio One. <laughs> yes, yes. It was pre Windows. For I mean, Windows was out, but it was pre on um, MS on DOS on a Commodore it's... 64. It was ridiculous. It was you really, can really rotate ridiculous. a pixel at a time. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I mean, it was really interesting because it was like to do anything. There were different like like rooms or areas, like you had to switch from the modeling like version of the, the software to like an expert that to do any animation and then rendering was in a separate place. So it, it was really weird. Um, but he brought me into this class. He only did it once. And we basically got locked in the um, on the weekends, like on Saturdays, locked into the school, like the labs were closed, but he had a key. And there were basically, I think like 12 of us and we just stayed in the lab for eight hours. And he was basically like one weekend ahead of us. He basically had the manual and was just trying to keep ahead of like what he was teaching us. Wow. Um, but that was legitimately the only time I've ever felt flow before that. Like you hear people who pick up a guitar and they just like start jamming. Yeah. Um, that was that, that's the first time it ever happened to me. And um, I started, everybody else was doing kind of just like boxes moving and I, I modeled a character, I rigged it, I animated it. And like at the end of the class, we had a little show. We went to this guy's house and just like, he had the videotapes when there used to be videotapes. It's embarrassing to say how long ago this was. Um, but he, he put printed everything off to like VHS and everybody played it. And it was like a little, like like a film show. Um, and, and like, everyone was like, when did you start doing that? When, like, did you do that like three semesters before? I'm like, no, I just was making it the same time you all were. And then I knew there was something there. It was like the first time I've ever done any art that like made any kind of effect on people. First time I moved something that like, you know, felt like it had life. And then yeah. I took off from there. Um, so yeah. And then I had a long, hard road to find motion design or motion graphics. It took me like another 10 years to like figure out that that was. So what were you doing in the meantime between finding flow state and then, uh, you know, becoming successful at motion graphics itself, which wasn't really an industry no, no, I mean, all. I really wanted to get, you know, like anybody who gets an animation, I wanted to get to Pixar, I really, to be honest, I wanted to do 2D animation, but this was right when Disney was starting to kind of shutter everything. And obviously like Toy Story had been out, I think Bugs Life came out when I was in school, again, dating myself, but um, 
So that was super exciting. But I went to a school and I was going to go there for two years, transferred. And me and three of my friends were going to do 2D animation, hardcore, teaching ourselves. There are a couple of teachers that were there that knew a little bit about like working in Flash. Um, and everybody that was graduating after us was coming back to try to teach at the school because there were no jobs doing 2D. So I think in like a semester or two, I was like, I, we got to learn 3D. And we basically just hold ourselves in a lab and just taught ourselves as much as we could. Um, after that, I think you mentioned that you did like some work on like a preschool show. My first job out of school, um, I was working on a preschool show that was kind of like like um like a religious version of Winnie the Pooh <laughs> like if that makes any sense it was um from the guys the do you remember Veggie Tales of course that? I grew up with so, Veggie Tales <laughs> yeah so I didn't that makes me even feel younger when you say that um <laughs> but I I didn't um I didn't work on Veggie Tales but a guy who worked there basically stole like a contract and like created this other series um and it was actually it was amazing because for like the first 18 months out of school I wasn't just animating a shape that was bouncing in some face shapes it was like fully limbed characters that could act and articulate and like look at camera and talk so we were like slugging dialogue we were doing posing we we're doing storyboarding this little group of like 10 people um and it was amazing it was again it was it was again like being in a master's degree program after you just went to school for a couple of years because you're doing all of it um and then after about a year the bottom just dropped out i'm from chicago all like a lot of the cg animation even the 2d animation that was there the bottom dropped out and i started working in gaming for i think like a good six or seven years oh, wow. um until i until i moved to la um and it, it wasn't even really gaming like everything is like every time i say something it's like it's only kind of like half true because it was um video games but for slot machines um so <laughs> it doesn't sound as exciting as it is when i said just gaming um but the cool thing was when i was there I got to lead a team. We had these mini studios and you got to hire people, you know, as it kind of went along. And even though Disney was shutting down, that meant I could hire Disney people. So I basically hired a bunch of people to work on my team that worked on like Brother Bear and Lilo and Stitch and all this Disney stuff that was done in the Florida studio. Um, so I got like another round of like master's degree program because I was teaching them 3D and After Effects, but I was learning all the good stuff from them, all the great 2D stuff about time. You were still doing slot machine yeah. animations? Wow. Yeah, we were doing we were doing some pretty for the time pretty aggressive like like pushing the limit for what you could do at the time with like video screens over spinning slots or like transparent screens so you could animate characters on the sides and they'd interact with stuff and it was awesome man there were people like there were all these all these animators that were like 20 years older than me that were just like ah oh, you're drawing wrong let me show you how to do this teach me how to render like where's the yeah. I, I felt like I was I was stealing from them because it was like I'm basically just giving them the instruction man yeah like, you're like why would I ever pay for school I should just <laughs> hire Disney animators. To yeah animates it was if you go to vegas amazing. are some of those slot machines you know yeah. animations? yeah okay yeah there's there's still a few there because you know like we the other thing we did there is like we worked really fast right so like my first job i think most i don't know if this is still the case but my friends that are working at like disney or pixar like from my knowledge like they're doing like three to five seconds like a week you know there's a lot of performance there's a lot of interacting with yeah, your other yeah, yeah. You know, the shot before and shot after and the scene before and scene after my first job we were doing i think like eight seconds a day so wow. it was just like like ridiculous like it's not even possible to animate that fast that was the ask was like just crazy amounts um but you got used to working really fast and coming up with ideas and testing them very quickly um so that kind of stuff that kind of churn and burn animation plus all this 2d knowledge not even about the like skills of like drawing or doing trace backs or anything like that but how to think about um posing and timing and spacing and thinking about texture timing so you only use ones when you need them. You know, not everything has to be on ones and twos. You know, you can have threes or fours if you're intelligent about it, or if you layer and pepper, you know, ones on parts of like the clothing or the hair. Um, that stuff got integrated really, really early on to me to the point where like up until into the spider verse, I'm like, nobody understands timing. Like you can do so much with like yeah. poppy timing or layered timing or texture timing. But now that that's out and we're seeing the kind of like the effects that that's had it's kind of cool to see animation finally, like I think maturing even further than it was before. So, okay. So it sounds like you have learned a lot of different areas very fast, including like economies of scale with animation, different yeah. timing techniques, different media types. How, did, like what stopped you from pursuing, you know, character driven animation, which you got into from the start and pursuing mm -hmm. something where you're, you know, doing random stuff all the time, could be you're animating like Starbucks, Starbucks cups, and then you're animating like a car commercial, and then you're animating like a character. Like, you know, yeah. is it the is it did it, was it just a natural progression of that, or did you pursue Not, you know something where you were always like doing different stuff? Uh, I I would say it's a combination of abject fear and uncontrollable curiosity. Fear and curiosity, <laughs> like, the two like the, those two. Yeah, like, <laughs> like there, it, it, if I would have known 
what could have happened had I moved to LA sooner, I would have moved to Los Angeles 10 years earlier. But I think um, coming where I came from, it was just such a, I felt like so lucky to even have a career as an artist, like a working artist. Yeah. Coming from the South side of Chicago where I knew no one else that did that, right? Like it, it was, it was almost like something to be embarrassed about. Um, and because I kind of like, passed up this like chemical engineering career that was kind of laid out in front of me that would have been easy it would have been like very chemical engineering doesn't sound easy to me it it, i'm not definitely not bragging but it's just like whatever it was that my school kind of identified to me and said go do this and then kind of just pushed me along the way like it's almost like if somebody saw a basketball a kid who's got good skill for basketball they're like go be a basketball player we'll set everything up for you chemical engineering was kind of like that at the school i went to where it was just like this is it this is a path you go here they go here they go here you can make a job doing this these are the three places you can go life set up um and i just kind of jumped off that assembly line like just as fast as i could but i still and i I fight this still today like i still carry a little bit of that like there's there's a thing when you come from the south side of chicago and i think a lot of the midwest that like if you do anything other than just worry about safety and security you're almost being a little selfish but to be able to go to the animation industry you have to be selfish a little bit you have to care more about like your wants versus like your needs i think you know like so that took me a long time. Um, but then I'm also like, I'm looking at my my bookshelf and everything around me. I've got like a, a DSLR here. I've got comic books there. I've got a ton, a ton of books on films and movies and animation over there. Like I like all that stuff, comic books. And um, that was the thing that drew me to it. Once I learned about motion design, I could be like, oh, I could use all these interests and all of these skills. And um, it was a big thing for me to call myself an artist, like a capital A artist. But once I accepted it, like I used to tell people I just worked on computers. I was yeah, slightly yeah. embarrassed to be an animator at the time, at least. I was like, when people would ask you, like, I work on computers. And that was all I would say. They're like, um, oh, I understand it, computers. And yeah, you're an animator, like, okay, it's cool. like, what? <laughs> so once I got over that, and then I, I feel like I've kind of doubled down on like, well, an artist, you never stop learning, right? You're not afraid of tools. You embrace new tools. You embrace new mediums. You embrace, you know, it's almost like being an athlete, except your body will never break down. You're always trying to develop yourself and develop your eye, develop your mind, your taste, your skills. Um so motion design just became perfect because it is a little bit of all that. So at what point did you, you know, you had this epiphany and how did it change things for you? Like essentially you stopped going towards this certain types of jobs or you moved mm-hmm. to LA or like, you know, when yeah. you started changing how you thought of yourself, how did that change your career path? Well, I, I have a very specific moment and a very specific person. I, w- I won't necessarily drop their name, but I can tell you the situation when I was at this, this company making slot machines. Um, I had this really, really talented 2D animator. He used to work at um, Don Bluth. He worked on like Titan AE and Anastasia and just like this, this like otherworldly level of talent that I think it's a good thing to tell people that is like, you think you might know a lot of the names of people who work in the industry, but there's two or three more layers worth of people that just don't promote themselves, that don't look for kind of like their name and lights that are as good, if not better than everyone, you know, and this, this gentleman was one of those people, but he was amazing at drawing, like drawing, like the, the ability to kind of like craft performance and life with a pencil and paper. Yeah. Um, and he was one of the best draftsmen I've ever seen, but his mind was incredibly sharp. And um, I was tasked with trying to force him to learn to work on the computer. And after about six months of just like, I tried everything, like here's flash, here's after effects, here's 3d here. We can scan your drawings and someone else can clean them up just because we need to be more efficient at the company we're at. He finally took me out to lunch one day. He's like, I don't want you to feel bad, but he's like, I'm quitting. I was like brokenhearted. And he's like, but I'm not quitting. I'm leaving the industry. I'm done. I haven't spent 15 years getting great at, and he held up the pencils, like getting great at making this my tool to be told I have to leave it. He's like, I've already stopped yeah. working in feature animation. I tried doing TV and there's not enough time. Now I'm working on slot machines. He's like, this is an embarrassment to me. I'm going to go find something else to do. And when he left the next day and he, I walked past his empty office, I walked in and I was just like, I don't ever want to be this way. Yeah. I don't want to be so tied down to my tool or to my, my expectations of my industry because it'll break your heart. You know, we're, we're watching it right now, right? We're seeing what Netflix has done with bringing in all this great, like diverse talent. And then all of a sudden they just cut the knees out of that. You know, like we're watching Warner brothers get kind of like obliterated. Um, and I, I can talk more about Warner brothers cause I worked on a project for them for like three years. Um, I was like, if I invest in myself as an artist, I'll never be brokenhearted. I will still always love what I love and not have it taken away from me. And motion design look like the place where no matter what happens, there'll always be something I'll be happy about walking up and going to the computer and working on every day. So but that's, a, that's a very interesting topic to me because, you know, on one hand, you have uh, somebody who's poured their heart and, and soul into developing this insane talent mm-hmm. in a very niche specific area, which is totally a strategy to pursue a career yeah. and, you know, become a master in a niche and you'll always have work, hopefully. 
because right. people will need it versus, you know, it sounds like you saw that and said, I'm going to invest in myself and also kind of go along with technology and be yeah. kind of a jack of all trades in a niche area as well, because, you know, I don't want to reach a point where I'm not needed in this sense. Mm -hmm. So like, I, I don't think for me personally, like, I don't think there's anything wrong with either or it's unfortunate no. that this person, you know, left. And also I think it's amazing that you saw that and use that as insp inspiration to pursue what you've done. And you, you know, you've grown in leaps and bounds in that mm -hmm. as well. But wouldn't you say also you're tied to technology in that sense that you're always going to have to learn new techniques? Like what if Adobe suddenly is not yeah. the main thing anymore? And it's, mm -hmm. I don't know, Terry Mation platform <laughs> that you have to learn. Yeah. <laughs> What, what what was the the animation software you just talked to somebody about the the iPad app flip something flip a clip flip flip a clip yeah so yeah. so I I understand that fear but um I think what the the real lesson I learned from from this artist from this gentleman was that you you if you want to have a lifetime as an working artist you need to disassociate your hand from your heart hmm. or your hand from your brain right like you have these hand tools, whether it's clicking a mouse or whatever, but the real power, the real value, the real strength of what you do versus the people who can't do it, it's all, it's in here. And it's the thing that frustrated me about this guy was that he knew timing and posing and spacing better than almost anyone I could see. And he could literally watch something play back once and be like, oh, nope, you got to hitch here, go back four frames. He would literally like have somebody jog the frame back and be like, nope, see, and he's like, draw a line, draw the other frame at the keyframe and hash it out. See, see that. And you basically draw a timing chart over someone's animation like nope just pull it back here pull one frame out throw it into after effects and just use a liquify tool just to give some keep alive and you'll just like dude <laughs> your your drawing skills have nothing to do with it what you just did you're an animation director you're a director like you yeah. should be and he could not separate the fact that it took him the pride of it took him 15 years to get this good with this hand to be able to draw the way he drew and that he didn't realize that everything else that he picked up through the process of writing it it's like again sports you could be an average NBA player, but you could be the best coach in the world, right? Michael Jordan, worst coach of all time. Steve Kerr, best coach of all time. Played on the exact same team. One was a throwaway role player. The other one's the best player of all time. But he could not figure this guy that was, he could not realize that he was the best coach, the best director. That was the next so, comment I was going to make because you can evolve through the different stages of, you know, mm -hmm. what is needed in animation and creative director or, you know, yeah. supervisor or whatnot. So Interesting. Interesting. So, I mean, I think, I think in animation, there's basically like, let me see if I remember the numbers, right. There's like four phases, right? There's the, you're just kind of cumbersome with the tools. And I don't mean like tools, like a mouse or a wake. I mean, like the principles, yeah. then you get into body mechanics, then you get into performance, but that performance is micro. It's just like per shot. And then you have the bigger sense of being able to see the performance across all the shots. And when you have that, that's when I feel like this, the, the ability to start seeing as a director or a supervisor starts really clicking a place because you're seeing a bigger picture while still being totally confident, you know how to get there. You just don't have to do it yourself. Um, but I think a lot of people in animation, especially TV and film, they get stuck at body mechanics, right? Like they don't even want to think about performance because it's too daunting, even though that's animation. Animation is the illusion of life. Animation isn't being good at a pencil or being great at curves. It's the thought process that you give your characters to me that really is like what it's supposed to be about. So let me ask you this, you know, you're somebody who's had quite a long career. You've, you've also, you know, taught and overseen projects and whatnot. What, uh, what is your essential goal? Like you mentioned that you want to always have the heart and hand thing going on. Do you want to mm -hmm. stay within, you know, you're doing the animation yourself or are you, cause you're a creative director now, does that mean yeah. you're also animating on the day to day mm -hmm. or you're more or less overseeing stuff? Um, in motion design, I'm kind of afforded the ability to kind of split the difference because I, in motion design, it really does come down to, and I think you've talked to a couple people on your show about this, that it's essentially there's the pitching or the design phase, and then there's the making or animation phase. Yeah. Um, and because everything is fairly fast, um, I can normally pitch. And then if we win the pitch, set up a team, they get going. And while I'm doing another, my next pitch or two, I can normally grab a shot or two inside yeah. whatever the piece is like oh no you know what i want to animate that or someone will do rough animation and then i'll, I'll get my kind of ability to doing that by going into frame out and doing drawovers or going into photoshop and just frame by frame and kind of like showing where something could be kind of smoothed out or something could be made a little bit more chunky um but yeah i still do try to find moments to kind of like do stuff that's separate from like anything i want to do personal project wise but um yeah i mean i think you have to do that you have to do that partially so that your team believes in you but you also have to do that just to stay stay sharp so in your, in your career, like at what point, first of all, I guess I have two questions. At what point did you start to be taken seriously as a motion designer and like, mm -hmm. you know, somebody that 
people go to for that specifically because you have a, a, a high skill level in it and you're great to work with. And then secondly, like at what point did you make the switch that we just talked about where you're, you know, doing the animation work to overseeing it? So the first one is like, at what point did you, you know, kind of figure mm -hmm. out the accumulation of all this experience you have and put it into motion design and say, this is what mm -hmm. I'm doing. And then at what, and, and like people started seeing you as that person. And then the second yeah. question is like, when did you make the switch on yeah. top of that? So for the motion design, for the first question, you know, I had to, I, I owe a lot of my career as a motion designer to the fact that I snuck in through the back door into imaginary forces. Um, I, I, basically I, had a, <laughs> I basically had a, I had a friend who was there from Chicago. I moved to LA. Um, I was working, um, doing all the motion design for a company that was doing podcasts, like video podcasts and streaming. Um, but I got a call one day and they were like, we've gone literally through our entire, like, portfolio. We can't find a single freelancer. And this is, I think like nine or 10 years ago, but it's funny how this is now coming back. I'm the reverse for me trying to find people. Mm -hmm. I feel like the industry is in the same place. 10 years ago, no one knew Cinema 4D. There were barely any 3D people. Everybody was just After Effects and Photoshop. And I knew 3D, even though it was 3D Studio Max. Um, my friend called me. She's like, Hey, can you come in? We don't care if you come in overnight. We don't care if you come in over the weekend. We have a computer sitting in the kitchen that we need someone to take a spot just to finish out this job. And I was like, whatever that whatever sounds so do. enticing to me yes <laughs> come whatever on in I your weekend do. sit yes. in a kitchen at a ragtag computer at a super old computer yeah so basically what it, I, and i said yes like immediately so basically what had happened was um immediately they had yes. Done, yes it was immediate and i was like i was like you know i have this day job i do have a full-time day job um but i can be in on saturday morning you can just give me the keys you can lock me in like uh, you can bring me in thursday i'll come in overnights um so basically i went in and what happened was they were working on, um, they had done the titles for the trailer for High School Musical, like three or four years before. And somehow a producer in China was remaking High School Musical, but with Chinese pop talent. And they basically wanted to remake the entire same trailer. They just needed everything to be turned into, I believe, like Mandarin characters, like localized, essentially. And at the time, whoever made this thing at Imaginary Forces was using a plugin called Sapphire that no one at Imaginary Forces had, except for this one machine that they literally had like locked down put it in storage and it was like basically marked. Like if you ever like basically like pull the rip cord and open this up, if you ever need to update it. And the call came in, they set it down. Like, do you know Sapphire? I was like, sure. Never used it in my life. And I sat down and like overnight, like figured out, cause there's nobody there. So I could basically just go online, read the manuals to figure out what they'd done. And I just swapped stuff out. And then I, I just, it's weird. Cause I, I got in the back door because I was known as like a fixer basically. Like, yeah, I was going to ask, for, you know, how do you become the person yeah. that somebody calls at the last, when they've gone through their whole Rolodex and said, like we need, we need Ryan in here. Like, how do you, how did you become that person? I mean, it's just, like it sounds like you, you know, you had experience, yeah, some network, mm -hmm. people knew who you were, you did three, like how, like, how did you purport it's what yourself Eric, to this? It's what Eric Larson said. It's like, luck is really just the hard work and the opportunity just being prepared yeah. for it. Right. Like you just work really hard knowing. I love how you're you. pulling in all these other references from other podcast episodes. From your show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's true. I mean, these, these are common truths, right? Like I know I have a lot of friends who are screenwriters for films and um, they always tell me like, like whenever people come up to them, they're like, how do I get in the industry? They want to know that person's story. Right. And it's good to know that it can happen, but I feel like a lot of people's stories that you you aspire to be or that you look up to as soon as they open up that door and they walk in that door closes and it like basically like slams shut and disappears and it th there's no two like things but that that one anecdote about like well you sound like you're luckier it sounded like it finally came like it only happens because you prepared yourself and you know you happen to be yeah, i put myself in la i made sure everybody knew i was there and i had a current demo reel and it wasn't good but it showed that i could do certain things and somebody took a chance on me and someone else somewhere else might have but it was at imaginary forces right i had like three places i wanted to work at that was the top one when i moved to la i was like i'll do whatever i have to so i essentially that kept on happening and i think i permalanced there for like a year and a half like they just kept calling me back and eventually i got moved out of the kitchen i got moved into like the, the studio like with the rest of the artists um and i kind of just cozied up to one of the creative directors there and I was kind of like his fixer. I knew 3D. He didn't. He had jobs that needed 3D. When the render farm would break, I didn't know how to do it, but I'd stay late and I'd read up about it. I'd call my friends who might know how to fix it. I'd fix it. I'd, you know, I got really good at optimizing things. Um, and then yeah. eventually, to answer your second question, um, eventually there was a job that came in. Basically, what I did is I realized you can see all this like nerdy stuff that I have here. I started realizing that even though they got a lot of like comic book stuff, like they did the Marvel opening, like the original Marvel Studios logo um, at the beginning of all that stuff, um, even though they did that, 
there was no one in house that knew comic books or video games. Like no one, no one staff was in it because they're, they're, they had a very sophisticated taste level. Like they're all graphic designers. They all came from all the great schools. They didn't a have a lot of guy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They didn't have a lot of like um, people who are just like animation nerds, like in yeah. terms of like the, the, yeah. the um, mechanics of animation, they could, they could set type and kern and like lay out a, uh, an image, like a design. You know, like I said at the beginning of like there's design and there's animation, they could pitch a job and win it, but they need to bring people all the time to execute, to finish it. Um, and I realized that like fairly early on. So I basically kind of like crafted a, like a role or a character. And, like it was almost like cosplay. I was like, well, what do they need? They need it and that I could like sneak into. So like, well, I'll be the video game nerd. So I brought in all my video game toys. I brought all my comic books. I, I purposely put myself in a seat that was behind like a bunch of bookshelves. And I brought all my graphic novels and put them back there. And just like, I was just like, I'm going to make sure again, luck, you got to manufacture the luck. So every time a producer would come by, I was like, Hey, who knows? Wait, you have Hellboy. We're going to talk to the guy who's like pitching a Hellboy cartoon. Do you want to come along and be in the room? So I would just do that over and over. And it got to the point where there was a job that was for a video game cinematic that we were going up against two other companies that do video game cinematics all the time. And I was like, can I please just be in the room when, you know, the producers from the client come in and I just started talking and started talking and started asking questions and started listening. Um, and that turned into them giving us that job versus, you know, wow. two students that already done it. How do you, okay, um, so this, this is super interesting to me. I've never heard of anybody kind of playing with the subliminal mindset of the office by, you know, changing their, their, their office space and whatever. But how do you not be obnoxious about this and do this in a way that is like, you know, friendly and inviting? Like, even when you were brought into this meeting and you start asking mm -hmm. questions is like, you know, the producers and whoever made the meeting are bringing you in to be to, as like a, you know, a courtesy type of yeah. thing. You asked to be there. How do you start pushing your own, I guess, agenda in a, I mean, you, ha you have to do it with a smile and you have to do it with comedy, but you know, like I, none of this stuff is meritocracy, right? Like everybody's yeah. like, well, you know, animation is great because it, that's total bunk. It's not true, but you can create opportunities for yourself. It's the reason why, like, I talked to so many people during my open office hours where there's people from other countries and like, how do I break in? Like, how do I get into North America? And it's, I wouldn't say it's easier, but the opportunities are so more plentiful because there's so much more work. There's so many more canvases that our work can go on to. And now finally you can live anywhere and be considered on anything. And like two years ago, you couldn't work on a Marvel title sequence unless you're in the building and locked down in a room with no internet. That's changed, right? Like yeah, everything's yeah. changed. Um, and I feel like this, my story is very similar to that, where I was just like, man, like I didn't move here and leave everything I knew in, in Chicago and give up a really good paying job where I was leading a team full of people to just sit and wait. You know, I know it, like, like, I don't want to be obnoxious, but I do want to let people know. Like the thing about at least motion design is that there's never enough people. There's always more work than can be done. And everyone is always scrambling. Right. So if you can put yourself in a position where you're in the center of the storm, yeah. at some point you can just be like, oh, I, and, and you know, and I do this thing all the time. I'm not doing it right now, but I always, whenever I worked in a studio, maybe it's not as relevant now because nobody's working studios, I would always do this. It sounds dumb, but I would always be listening yeah. so that it didn't look like I was like, like, oh, wait, what's going on? I wasn't trying to be opportunistic, but I was always like, oh, that creative director just walked by and they said, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do for this Daredevil title sequence. So that for lunch, those, for those who just, are not watching the video, he just took off his one of his headphones and exposed his ear. <laughs> so so I was always listening to what's going. A hundred percent, yeah. You want to you want to hear what's going on so that you know you can wheel your way in there. I'm just wondering, you know, there's so many people in animation and whatnot, and, and it sounds like you're, you're like you're obviously a very driven guy. What is motivating you internally to like you know? I think you gave a good reason where you said you didn't give up all this you know good paying mm -hmm. job and leave leave Chicago, etc to just sit around and wait for opportunities. You're gonna make it happen. But what is, what, is, what is that underlying motivation that is driving you to do these things? I think- I What think, are you getting um, out of the successes that you're seeing with the career path you've chosen? That, that's a great question. I, I, I think I love what I love so much that I can't imagine not doing it, even if I wasn't getting paid for it. But the, when you live somewhere where you don't think what you love is possible and then someone just cracks the door open just a little bit yeah, and someone's like, I, I, can, I, I can tell people who know me are going to laugh because I always talk about this guy all the time. But like um, before I got into animation, I, I somehow found Guillermo del Toro's email <laughs> and we were on a message board and he happened to be and this is before he like like it was right before he made hellboy 2 and he would kind of like message people occasionally or like put little sneak peeks on a message board and he was he's always been like since i saw his, the first film he's been my favorite director and um 
I was still working at this video game thing and I was thinking about, should I go I make mean, slot machines? I shouldn't say video game, you know, not the coolest thing in the world, right? I'd been doing it for like six or seven years. All of my friends that worked there, we all went out to go see the movie. Um, I loved it. I couldn't believe how cool Hellboy 2 was. It's my favorite comic book with my favorite film director. And I emailed them that night. Like I was so overwhelmed. I emailed them. I was like, man, thank you so much. This gives me so much hope that like, if you try hard enough, you can come from anywhere and you can achieve your goals. He emailed me back. And we had like a six or seven email exchange wow. on opening weekend for his movie when he should be doing many other things, right? Um, and that that moment really made me think like, oh, I, I got to try. I got to try because I love this stuff too much, right? Like when I was a, a kid in high school, I made my own comic books, right? Like when I got my hands on a camera, I was, I think lots of people on your thing have said this, like as soon as I got a, my hands on my parents, like uh, VHSC camera, I, I got two D, like, two VHS, like uh, like VCRs next to each other. It was like, sh whatever I shot, I tried to dub it and edit it before I had a computer, right? Like, like if it's in you, you can't help it. And now the world is, the opportunities are so much. That's why I went to school in motion because it was like, the opportunity and the knowledge is there, but there's so many people banging on the door that aren't from the United States or don't have a lot of money that if we could kind of like expose people to the basics and show them how to run their business with something like the freelance manifesto, the industry as a whole would be better by people who never thought they could get in, getting in. And the 100%. way they speak to other viewers, whether it's an ad or a cartoon or a 30 second short, the world needs those voices. They need to hear from people who didn't think they could do something and now have a chance, have a shot. Um, so that's why for me, like, like, I mean, I'd be doing this stuff. I had etch a sketch animator 2000 when I was like eight years old and I used it till the screen burnt out. And pretty much from then I've been trying to find a way to do more of that. And it's just, I, we, I think we're all lucky that we happen to be here at a time when like what you can do on your iPad can make you money. Like that blows me away. Oh, it's, it's a hundred percent, a thousand percent what you just said. So if, if I get this right, you know, your, your drive comes from a love of what you do and also, you know, the realization that you can you can do it as well. Yeah. Like, you, like nothing is stopping you except if you, I guess, didn't didn't do it. Essentially, <laughs> if you weren't exposed to it, you know that's one thing, right? You know, like there's a lot of people who I always use this word. I, I use three words. I use voice, vision, and obsessions. Right? We all have these things that we get obsessed by, right? Like, like again, speaking about Del Toro, every time he watches movies, there's always gears. Everyone in his movies has giant gears. And it's just because the dude like looked at a, a watch and took it apart when he was a little kid. And ever since then, it's just an obsession, right? He loves bugs. He loves twisted little babies. Like everyone in his movies has those. And I think in motion design, we don't have enough people exploring their obsessions and pushing them and seeing why they mm. work and why they enjoy them. But um, for me, like I've been obsessed with this stuff. As soon as I found out that people make the things I love watching and reading and consuming, I was like, well, why can't I do that? Um, and why can't I get other people that want to do it to do that? Right. But that's only the only thing that's really stops you is like, there's free tools out there. If you can get your hand on a fairly not that good computer, you can use Blender. You can get, you know, draw 2d animation tools yeah. you can get a cheap cell phone and start shooting stop motion right like that stuff was not that accessible totally. when i started a long long 100%. time ago so you know i want to be conscious of your time but i'm wondering maybe That's we fine. can think we can uh switch up the topic a little bit and talk to please, me please, about please. spilt a little bit you know how does a mm -hmm. motion graphics driven company studio like what what is the business model essentially are you is it like because i know you have tons of projects going on at the same time mm -hmm. is it run kind of the same as like an advertising agency where they focus it just on that type of thing or is it a mix of you know you're working on tv mm -hmm. long-term things you're working on advertisements you're working on movies like yeah. what is what is the main difference of a studio focusing on work that you know motion design yeah. and graphics and all that versus something else or is, is there, there no I, difference because in in my I, I'm just going to keep talking because in my worry. perspective, you're competing with everybody essentially, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which I mean, that, doesn't it, sound too great. <laughs> it sounds scary, but I mean, I mean, the thing that's cool about it is I've every, you know, I've, I've worked staff at four, four different places now, but I freelanced at more than I can probably count. They're all different. Yeah. That's what's so cool about it. Because like the, especially now, you know, when you start adding real time, you start adding experiential, you start adding interactive, you start adding key art. Um, all the streamers have different kinds of requirements and needs now that like every shop could be totally different. I, 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 the best way I can couch it to you is right. Like, so I'm at school of motion and I'm starting to get the itch, a big job I had worked on before I started at school of motion. I spent a year and a half basically designing Warner brothers first hotel. Like Disney has all their hotels that are, you know, very themed. Warner Brothers was building a hotel next to their only real theme park in Abu Dhabi. And they basically had the building, like the infrastructure, but they came to us and essentially we asked them if we can make it feel more Warner Brothers. 
Hmm. And they bit, they went for it. So it was, it was a, I think it was in the end, it was almost a three-year project, but I basically was on it from the beginning all the way until they approved everything. And then I moved over to school motion, but for a year and a half, I was designing basically every single step of this hotel. So like when you hear about the hotel, the advertising, the website, how does it speak in a Warner brothers voice? But then also when you walk in, how does everything feel like Warner brothers? And it, the big deliverable was we did about 90, around 90 minutes of animation across six very different screens. So there's like a six story tall screen that we have. I basically have the Iron Giant walk up and greet you at the real height of the Iron Giant. You know, wow. it's six stories tall. Um, we have these really cool columns when you walk into the lobby that play all different things. Like Warner Brothers is crazy, right? Like it's a bunch of different ah. things. Um, but I'm going the to Google this right now. While look talking. it up. Yeah. It's called the WB Abu Dhabi. Um, but basically the key tenet of it was it would have been really easy to just repurpose stuff that had already been made. Our yeah. number one rule, like we set a, cer a certain amount of rules for it. The number one rule is that everything at the WB hotel will be bespoke. It'll be brand new, be something created. So every, every surface is not 1920 by 1080. They're all unique, different surfaces. Everything you see was crafted by an artist. It wasn't just ripped from something that was already made. So like we have this really cool thing where there's, there's three long columns and we do Tom and Jerry as if they're in Ocean's Eleven. So each column is a different point of view of the traditional kind of like living room. And Tom is, you see Tom up close in like his little mouse hole in one column, but the third column, you see him just tiny in the corner, like it's a three quarter down view. And it's basically like a four minute animation of Tom trying to, or I'm sorry, Jerry trying to get a piece of cheese that's on the table while Tom chases him. But you see it from all these different perspectives and like the room slide across and all this stuff. So um, it was basically like, what if Steven Soderbergh directed Tom and Jerry. Um, yeah. And there's 90 minutes of stuff like that. Um, so I was doing all that stuff. Um, and that's one type of job, right? It's a year and a half. And then we spent another year and a half to make it because we didn't have a lot of money. We had like $3 million to make like a feature film's worth of like actual animation content, which is another yeah. story for another day. Um, but I think could only be done by like a motion design company, not an actual animation studio. Um, so you have that side, right? And that's like, you get a big project and you staff up and you work on it for a year and a half. Um, but then you work at like a company like Spilt where I'm working and um, we get a phone call three times a day from people who are like, hey, we have a TV show. We need to make a graphics package or we have a documentary. Can you guys make a title sequence that makes everybody stop and watch our show when they're watching on Netflix or HBO Max or whatever? Like, how do you make this murder mystery, which there's 7,000 of them? How does it look and feel different enough that people actually spend their time and watch it? Or we get a, um, a company that's making a new soft drink and they're like, we need to come up with the packaging and the labels and the animation and maybe even the name so we stand out in a crowd. Um, so that's why I say at the beginning of this, like it's all problem solving. Uh, it's all through the, the 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 spectrum of using my animation design skills from 20 years. Yeah, and we're still using After Effects and Cinema 4D and Photoshop. Um, so in, but that's internally, not storytelling. It's internally, what is the team like? Because you know you could bring together three, like you mentioned before, three people to work on this project. Yeah, or 15 people to work on this other project. Like you have no expectations of what's coming in the door. Do you, mm -hmm. Does that mean your team is very like, you know, everybody kind of knows everything. Uh, everybody has multiple skills and it's very modular all the time. Or yeah. are you, you know, more smaller and then you hire as you uh, get a big contract, you bring in like 30 new people and for that mm -hmm. contract type of thing. Can, can I say both? Both. Why <laughs> not? Why not so, both? So, I mean, and, and that's why I was saying, like, um, I feel very strongly that motion design isn't just animation for advertising. There are, we have, I think, six or eight artists that I feel like are motion designers with like capital M, capital D, that yeah. they might have one main skill set. We have a couple people that are great at 3D, a couple people that are great at 2D cell animation, a couple that are great at After Effects, really good compositor. And then kind of like, um, I hate the term generalist, but kind of like a, um, a specialist of everything. Yeah. But then all those people also almost all of them have another complementary skill that they're like the second best at that overlaps with everybody else. So everybody can kind of be put into these like mini teams. Yeah. And I was going to say like, what is, why would, why would spilt hire somebody full time mm -hmm. versus uh, just like contract basis? Like I understand like creative director and, and like yeah. that kind of role where you're overseeing, you know, the vision, mm -hmm. but like why hire full time people if you're always, you know, that is that again is a great question that I think a lot of studio owners are asking themselves right now, because probably right before COVID, maybe a year before that, the whole industry was starting to go very freelance heavy. You know, like yeah. a lot of people, thanks to someone like Joey Corman and the freelance manifesto, a lot of people were enlightened as to what like freelance lifestyle is like as an artist, where you book yourself, you control your rates, you choose what you want to work on, how long you want to work on it, when you want to take a break, vice versa. Um, so a lot of times these studios will 
used to have a team of 10, 12, 15 people. We're starting to get down to like five or six, like you have the owner, producer, a head of production, something like that. And then a creative director too. And then maybe a couple staff people, most of the time, maybe a little bit older, been around for a while, maybe don't know all the new tools, but are really great at the tools they know. And then you're just hiring freelance when you needed it, when you could get it. Um, but then, you know, when COVID hit, the amount of work that made its way towards motion design, just like if it wasn't an order of magnitude, it was at least two or three times more the amount of wow. work. And now all of a sudden, all the great freelancers were like, you know what? I'm charging $200 a day more and I'm not going to work as much. Or I'm going to do one big project. I'm going to do a project for myself. And then there was this curiosity of love them or hate them. Last year, at least NFTs were taking a lot of 3D artists out of the normal like level of availability because people were like, I can make my own stuff and be my own client. So all of a sudden, every shop was just like, okay, like who can we get? How can we get them? Let's find a project to stick them on. So they're just, you know in the studio. Um, but at Spilts, we've had like, I would say, I think five or six of the staff have been there for more than five years. And I think the big reason to do it is that just like when you watch animation, you're like, wow, Gendy Tartakovsky has used Scott Wills and a couple of the other same people on all of his projects since like Samurai Jack. The shorthand that you have from working with the same people, whether it's on a really long project or a small project, yeah, yeah. and the development of your skills together where you're like, oh, you know what? I don't have to be the best background painter because Scott can crush it and I can just focus on directing. But then after I've directed two things and part of my signature is Scott's work, we need to stay together. Like we have yeah. to do what we can do and you complement each other in a way that um, you become a team, like the truest sense, like a real team, right? I totally. go back to just sports the Efficiencies all the time, right? of knowing how the other person works and communicating, that makes sense too. I'm wondering, and also you know just, there's certain things that just you're not capable of if you don't have that person creatively, right? You know, yeah, like yeah. Jordan, I hate to keep coming back to sports. I don't even watch sports now, but I grew up in Chicago when the Bulls won. Jordan never won a, um, a championship till Scottie Pippen came, right? Scottie Pippen never won anything after Jordan left, but while they were together, they did things they weren't capable of. And I feel like that's probably a reason why Spilt has people on staff. And we're actually, yeah. honestly, right now, we're looking for junior talent to become part of that team that sticks around for a while. Interesting. So. I want to ask you about that, but I have one more question kind of from the business side of things. Yeah. You know, how do you, how do you get leads to, to keep like the lights on constantly? Like, is it a constant, you're bidding on everything? Do you work with agencies? Do you work with yeah all these different people to just try to get as many leads as possible? Because you yep. just mentioned, like, there's so many people going freelance. What's to stop that Netflix uh, murder mystery show or whatever you mentioned, crime mm -hmm. show, to just going to XYZ freelancer site and saying, mm -hmm. do you want to make this for us? Because, you know, I've talked to a bunch of freelancers who that's exactly how they get work yep. for big clients as well. So, so like, how are you competing mm -hmm. against this flood of new studios that are just, yeah. you know, people I mean, coming together? Most of the getting... they're competing. They're competing against everything, right? They're yeah. competing against. The, uh, sometimes, honestly, they're competing against their own employees, right? Like, yeah. especially with especially with remote now, right? Like, there's nothing to keep you as a as a staff artist who's you know getting assignments. You're working on Slack. You have yeah, your you're bidding on Warner Brothers, and uh, your employee yeah, and your ABT <laughs> are also bidding on Warner Brothers by themselves. <laughs> I, I I think that happens, you know, under the cover of darkness more often than any of us know or we're, are willing to accept. But I think that there's that I'm now being back on the studio side, that's part of my responsibility is to make sure that my artists are fulfilled yeah. and the artists that I work with are getting opportunities that they couldn't just go off and get themselves, right? And I still think it's perfectly within someone's right. If they can get the work done that I'm asking them to do and they have more time, go go for it. That's only gonna make you better when you come back and work with me. Um, but I will say like in terms of clients, you know, like we do, we do every trick in the book, right? We have relationships that are already existing with people that we hope to keep, you know, keep those leads warm. Um, when they leave and go somewhere else, we're the first person to call them like, hey, just so you know, don't forget about us. We'd love to be introduced. We do capabilities meetings all the time. Um, Pre-COVID, I would go and do road shows for, you know, like at the place where I was working on the Warner Brothers project, um, we would go and say like every quarter is going to be a different type of client that we're going to go out and try to meet. So one month or one quarter be like, let's go meet all the architecture firms that might need animation for their screens. Next month, let's go see all the TV TV networks. Um, whether you've met them or not, you just go and you continually do it. Um, but then like we we are we have reps that go out and kind of like take our work and we craft a story for the reps to say like, okay, go out and find 15 VC funded startups that are in the tech industry doing these kinds of things. And let's just talk to them. Let's meet them. You know, like so much of it is just like conversations. And I would say, even though yeah. I've done a lot of talking today, so much of it is about listening. Like, 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 I think that's a big part of it for, for motion designers is like, you have to get really good at like listening to people and understanding like, what's the real notes, what's the feedback, what's the need, you know, like that, that becomes a skill that they don't teach you in school, but the better you get it, I think the, the better your career can kind of turn out.
Yeah, I was just thinking also, you know, when you're with a company, you have a lot more manpower to just go out and do these things versus a freelancer mm -hmm. isn't able yes. to work and go talk to 15 di different industries a month. Um, okay, so let's let's chat about, you know, your hiring, et cetera. What, it, yeah. like, based on what you do and what, you know, you have a high uh, profile of uh, amazing animation, what are you looking for when you look at a portfolio? Because, you know, like say I do mostly 2D, would you look at my mm -hmm. portfolio or would you look at 100%. somebody who specifically like works in After Effects and knows that? Like, are you, are you looking more for like skills and principles of animation or technical abilities or a mix of both or somebody with experience? Like say, you know, I'm listening to this podcast right now and I'm interested in working with you. How would I make sure my real resume, whatever gets to the top of your, your brain? <laughs> um, I mean, it, it's different. You're talking about freelance or staff, but let's just couch it in terms of staff because that's kind of like yeah, that's yeah, what we're yeah. looking for. And freelance, it's a lot of like casting an actor for a film. You could be the best actor in the world, but if you don't have the specific like requirements, then they, like it's not right. going to work um, unless you're casting against type. But for 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 staff, for me, um, my I'd say like forty nine percent of it is okay. Like if you have a demo reel and it's two minutes. I'm almost, almost immediately disqualifying you when I'm going to watch it because I'm going to watch, yeah, I'm going to watch because, five seconds. <laughs> well, because at like a two minute demo rule means that you don't understand your audience and understanding your audience is really, really important when you're working in motion design, like knowing like, okay, like this, this demo reel isn't for your mom to show that you graduated school and show like, look what all this stuff I did. It's like, I need to teach someone or tell someone in five seconds why I'm the best person for them to bring in tomorrow. Right. Like, like it's that, I wouldn't say it's cutthroat, but it's that serious in terms of like, so, so just I'm, like to give perspective from a volume perspective, perspective, how many reels are you getting a day or a week that you're looking at? Are you getting a hundred a week? I, and you're like, oh my goodness, I'm yeah. overwhelmed. I just want five this, seconds. Like just for somebody. Is, yeah. This is a great time to ask me. Like we have three open positions for junior staff that we're saying we can hire for the most part, remotely, almost anywhere. There's a couple yeah. of places that's very hard for us to like, you know, get money to um, just because the way the world is right now. And I think we've had these up for maybe a week and I think I'm over 350 um, resumes and reels. Um, that's and crazy. we have an automated system to try to take care of it. And I, frankly, I'm shocked that it's not more, to be totally honest. I I, I think that um, there's a lot of people who disqualify themselves before ever sending something because they're like, I'm not ready or my work doesn't match the work I see on their site, or I just got to get a demo reel together in a couple of days and a couple of days turn to three weekends. And then a month later, like, ah, it's too late. I probably can't do it. Um, yeah. So I'm, I'm frankly surprised it's not like 500, but um, so yeah, it's a lot of, first of all, you said automated system, which I haven't heard from an animation studio yet. Yeah, that's something more when you think of like, you're applying to businesses yep. like insurance or whatever, and you mm -hmm. have to put in the right keywords in your resume. What is your automated system sorting through? So basically we, we have, um, at least we're testing out for this time because we have three junior positions. We knew there'd be a lot of people. Yeah. Um, so we're using a system that basically you send in an application, you fill out kind of like, here's my, you basically fill out a cover letter, two or three paragraphs, um, link to a resume, and then you can add any other like social media links. Number one shocking most thing that never fails my entire career. Someone responds to an application, however they do it, email, automated system, LinkedIn, they make it impossible to find their demo reel. Number oh one goodness. thing, the easiest thing you should do is make sure before I read any of your stuff, the first thing I want to do is try to watch your demo reel. If I yeah. can't find your demo reel, I'm going to read and see if there's something that like lights my interest. But like, if you make it impossible. So, I mean, there's been a couple of people so far in the last two weeks where somebody I made less really, really, really good animations. <laughs> Hire somebody, me. There, there have been a couple. I mean, honestly, if someone did that and they put their link, I would look at the link right away. But no cool. link, no link at all. Just trust no me. link. Then yeah, just no, trust me. No, then, I mean, unfortunately, I'd be like next because there's 325 <laughs> other people. But yeah. sometimes someone will write something really passionate. Or they'll 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 reference something, or they'll have listened to this podcast and they'll like reference to something you might have said or I might have said. We're like, oh, someone's paying attention, and I'll do a little bit of work to try to find it and then kind of go there. Um, yeah. But for me, especially for these kind of like junior or middleweight positions. I want to get some sense of who the person is beyond just the work, right? And um, you know, like I do these open office hours that anybody can kind of like reach out and I go over demo reels. I probably like coach five or six different people every week or two wow. about their demo reels. So I've seen a lot of reels. I've done like 500 open office hours. I created a class called Demo Reel Dash for School of Motion where you can kind of get everything that I could possibly think about demo reels, like condensed in like three weeks. Um, so for me, like the big thing is besides just like, okay, you can make something look beautiful. I want to know what you're interested in. If it's a staff position, I want to know if like, I feel like I can help you, right? You know, like if you have a bunch of work, but it's not the kind of work we do very often, it doesn't mean it's disqualified, but it, it, it almost is like, well, I don't know if we're the right fit for you. I don't want to put you in a place where, you know, we can't help you as much as you can help us.
Yeah. You mentioned something that uh, is like the number one hardest thing for people to do. And that's tell me about yourself. Like what makes yeah, you you? Absolutely. So, so like, what are you looking for? Like, you know, for me, I'd be like, you know, I'm a 2D, 3D stop motion animator, worked on some TV shows, but what more do you want to know about me specifically that makes you interested to hire me as a person? That's a, that's a great question. Cause it's hard to kind of, it's a hard one to answer. And people say like, like, you know, I love hiking and gardening. And like, is that, is that what you're looking for? No, I, I think it's more like, you know, I love to see people pushing, like, like punching above their weight, right? Like I love seeing somebody who's like, you know what, all I've ever done is clean up. Um, but I, I animate a couple of shots and in their demo reel full of cleanup or in betweening, they have a couple yeah. shots I did. And even if they're not great, when I go to their website and I see what they're doing, their newest thing is the, are these things they're trying to push. Um, that's why one of the first things I do, I know people hate hearing this, but like a lot of times I'll go to someone's website and I'll see if they have like my stuff or my sketches or others or about me. And I like to see yeah. what else they're, they're showing or if they're linking to other work. Like, are you a photographer? Are you into, into type? Are you into, if you're into hiking, do you go and take photos? photographs and manipulate those. Like, what are you doing with your art outside of the thing you think I'm trying to hire you for? Because that indicates, at least at staff at a motion design shop, that there's going to be a lot of things that we can mold and shape you into. Because every day I have no idea what's coming is going to be asked of me or my team. But if I know you, again, you have a voice and a vision yeah. and obsessions, those things will make you the kind of person that would fit into a team where every day it could be wildly different from the next day. Well, even even just in this chat, like I already know you like comic books and Marvel and all this other yeah. stuff too. Just be, and you kind of included that in you know mm -hmm. the subliminal messaging of getting hired. But I also feel personally attacked because you know how often I go to somebody's <laughs> website and go to their about us before I have them on a podcast. Yeah, and I like because I want to get to know them who they are so I can interview them right. better. And I was just thinking, my about me page has on my website it has nothing. nothing because I don't want to talk about myself at all. I hear that. Yeah. I, wonder how I many know people went to my about me page on my website and they're like, Who, who's this guy? <laughs> well, I mean, the other thing is if your work's awesome, like immediately I, I'm talking about all this stuff. That's like, if you have knockout amazing work where it's like, Oh my God, I wish we could, if we had you on our team, the work we could win. Yeah. I mean that, but, that but that's you're, but like, like yeah, you're hiring for junior, which you're not expecting knockout, but I really like exactly. what you said about just kind of being honest about where you're at and what you want to do. Like, mm -hmm. like, you know, I'm a cleanup artist, but I really want to become an animator and I've done these couple shots and like, I I'm looking to like develop my skill set. And, and like you go to their website and you see the sketches, you see that they're doing personal work. That makes a lot more sense to me because, you know, I've, in my business career, I've hired people before and you do, when you're interested in somebody, you kind of are looking for somebody who's a go-getter and knows mm -hmm. who they are, knows what they want, because you want those people on your team to propel your team forward and make, you know, just grow what you're doing, period. Not just to bring somebody that's just doing the work. You want to bring somebody that's going to push forward. So let's, yeah. okay. So you're looking for, you know, the real, some information about who they are. And like, mm -hmm. what am I including in this reel specifically? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I think I blow people's kind of on their back when I tell them this, but I would much rather watch a 15 or 20 second demo reel with four shots that mm -hmm. are your best work than yeah. a minute or a minute and a half of a little bit of everything that isn't really that strong. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, I've, I've brought in people that ended up being staff artists at places I've worked at that literally have three shots on their demo reel plus their name at the end of it. But that work was so interesting and so compelling. And I went to their website and they had a behind the scenes on how hard they worked and what they researched and what they said. I was like, this person's like, I don't care if they have 15 more shots, like if they can do that and have that level of like interest and attention to detail and curiosity. I'm in like that. That's amazing. I want to work with that. I, I want to sit next to this person and soak up whatever it is they've got. Are there any other, you know, like, are there any other harder soft skills that you specifically look for, like personality wise or, um, you know, just even like technical experience? Yeah. Um, I, I say this in um, my, my class. Um, this, I have a free class at School Motion. I don't work there anymore, so it's not a shill. It's a free class. But it, uh, this thing I put together called Level Up. Um, and I talk about this thing about the kind of this idea about um, having the sense of an artist operating system. You know, you have a lot of my, my screenwriter friends I mentioned before, like you're only as good as the stuff you read. So it's like, if yeah. it's garbage in, it's garbage out. You're only the best. You're the sum of like the five people you spend the time around and the last five things you watched and the last 10 things you've read. Um, but I feel like I'm trying to figure out what I was going to say. What was tell me the question again? I was going. What what else that. do you look for in hard and oh. soft skills? Yeah, so I I really feel like that sense of like curiosity is huge for me, and that's again another reason why I go to like Instagram and these other places. Um, but that that artist OS, there's like three things that I think, especially in motion design, are like superpowers or like 
core skills that are almost like software you should be able to like double click in your operating system and a lot of people are afraid to develop them but if i see someone who does any of these three things if i see someone who's a great drawer someone who can just draw and not even like illust I, there's a big difference between illustration and drawing but like with a couple of quick kind of pencil marks i can understand like a, a storyboard from you and i can hand that to somebody and go immediately i want to talk to you yeah. um if you can write in motion design writing is an incredible skill that is like incredibly underdeveloped across i've met some creative directors that i'm just like i don't know how you've done this job because whether it's grammar or brevity or or mm. um detail wise the writing is just like if i gave your work the images you made and just replace the writing with someone else's writing you win jobs immediately nothing different than the writing um writing is a huge skill set um and then the final one like honestly it's just talking like do you have the ability to listen and on the fly speak to someone and make it seem like you already knew what what the answer was going to be even though you just heard the question you know two seconds ago so those three things are kind of like i don't know if that answers your question in terms of soft yeah, skills, no 100 it, it totally makes sense me. because you know a lot of the times you just think if i just get to a certain skill level of my artistry then i've made it but there's so many other you know well-rounded things that you need to be as a human being to to mm -hmm. you know just working with others being able to communicate clearly your ideas take feedback listen be curious like all those other things that you essentially school doesn't teach you to do no it's just which is crazy because <laughs> if you think about it, it very rarely is animation not a team sport very oh, yeah 100 right so so the ability to to draw for communication for like your peer or your supervisor the ability to write something especially now in the covid world where it's like 90 percent of our communication is on slack or email um and then talking you know like if you have to do a huddle or a zoom or something like that yeah. there's so many people yeah. who don't feel comfortable speaking up no. that like how, how can you work in a team if you don't have those a confidence in those skills well i definitely like i don't know being a recent sheridan uh animation student myself there's definitely a hundred percent those opportunities but they're not you know it's it's you you have to pursue those opportunities for yourself right. to give feedback right. to whatever it's more or less they teach you the skill and if you happen to develop all those things on the side that's great because you're just in a team environment all the time right but it's right. not you know there's no course on how to communicate like you, you, we were never forced once to write or give feedback or take feedback or, mm -hmm. you know, in our animation, which is super interesting to me, actually, yeah. because that's all the industry is. <laughs> that's right. Right. It's, I mean, I mean, I wonder if so much, I, I always question myself all the time, like how much did going to school for two years to like study, to be a scientist, like, did that affect anything or did, I, cause I, I used to always think it was like, it held me back. Cause I'm like, man, I'm behind every, I'm always feel like I'm behind. No matter what, because I had I, I started two years later and I was trying to play catch up. I didn't have all the core fundamentals. Like I kind of intuit a lot of my like feelings about type or design or color theory versus yeah. like having two years of just like getting it built in you. But I also think like maybe that's where like the the writing and the speaking came from, because you would have to justify your hypothesis. You'd have to research it. You would have to write it. That kind of got built in at an early totally, kind of totally. age. Um so yeah, I think maybe that that was a little bit of a benefit, even though the rest of us- Oh, I, I think it probably was 100%. I felt the same way because I went back to Sheridan right. when I was 30 years old and I felt super behind because there were 19 year olds whose skill level was yep. 10 times what I was. But what I what they didn't have, which I had, was kind of the business acumen, the pitching, the communication style, the you know, the time management figured out, which I learned from my career and you know, my, right. my schooling ahead of time, which I didn't even think would apply. Cause I was, you know, I was just being dumb. Like, I don't know anything about animation. I'm here to learn. And then <laughs> I get there and I'm like, Oh, wow. Well, yeah. I have all these other things figured it. out. Yeah. I just need the skill, which, you know, you can, you can pick up by studying. So, okay. You know, let me ask yeah. you one more question. Say yeah. somebody's listening to this right now and they're interested in mo motion graphics and they're doing something mm -hmm. else. You know, they're uh, working a day job that's unrelated to animation. They're doing this on the side or they're working a day job in animation and mm -hmm. they love playing around and experimenting and, and they do a whole bunch of other stuff. At what mm -hmm. point should this person listening or, you know, kind of say yes to pursuing motion graphics seriously? What is like a good sign for them to internally to say like this like i should go into this yeah because what are those reasons do you think yeah well I, I would say a if you feel like you're behind or you feel like it's gotten too late especially when you talk about motion design even more so than vfx or film or tv animation you have something because you haven't started that inside of you that is an advantage over everybody else who just started at 18 years old and all they know is the echo chamber of animation motion design right now and it has been for a long time is kind of like living in this valley of self-referential kind of like styles and, and and techniques that because you're coming from it from the outside and you have an interest a you're at an advantage i mean you 
Hmm. You're, you're a good example of something like that. So don't think that like you're behind. The skills themselves, especially in motion design, can be practiced and taught fairly quickly, like to be able to get to the point where at least right now, there are so many opportunities. There are so many jobs. There are so many clients, whether you want to be able to freelance on your own and set up your own thing, get collect into a collective with two or three other like-minded people that you find or go to a studio. It, the demand for talent is so high and the supply is so low that if you take a couple of the right courses, give yourself a couple of self-motivated projects. And like I said, can put together a 30 second reel that shows that you're interested in learning and that you have the ability to set keyframes and you have a, just a modicum of taste in terms of design. Um, right now that we need you, like the industry needs you. I need you literally right now at a company like Spill because we're trying to find you. <laughs> if you're but listening that is, to this, reach yeah, out exactly. right afterwards. <laughs> but I can tell you, I'm also, I also take place in a bunch of other like online communities and a couple other kind of like little companies that speak to shop owners doing motion design specifically that we are all in the same position. We cannot find enough people Everyone is willing to try someone out on a job. So there are opportunities out there if you have just like the base level of talent. Um, and if you are super interested in like film and TV animation or making your own cartoons or, you know, doing your own animation, I think motion design is a great place to test it out hmm. and then find your way. Because, you know, if you can set keyframes and create a motion with a square or with a circle that has a little bit of shading on it and your posing time and spacing works, that can transfer fairly quickly into 3D animation, 2D animation, stop motion. You can motion get really cheap technology to motion capture yourself and edit that, right? Like they can go into a real-time game engine. The, the entry point into bigger things, if you think of them that way, into film and TV animation. I know a lot of people that started in After Effects and motion design that are now working in film and TV animation, that they use motion design as a launch pad to get there. Um, yeah. That said, there's a lot of amazing stuff in motion design and it's only going to get wider. There's more and more motion design studios doing just character animation, just short form narrative storytelling um, mm. that, that you don't have to do the, I got to go to school for four years, put myself into a lifetime of debt, freelance for a while, get out to LA or get out to another place that has it, you know, this kind of work. And then like, just like hustle, like, you know, mad just to break in and then hope that like you get a job for a contract for six weeks and then the next one for two years and then the next one for two weeks. Like, there's, there's another world out there if you love animation beyond just, oh my God, I want to see my stuff on the screen. Yeah, 100%. So it sounds like, you know, if, if you're thinking about it, just learn some rudimentaries, mm -hmm. basics, uh, create something very short and simple and reach out to somebody like you or a studio because yeah. there's so many people willing to give chances. Great. Um, maybe this is a good, as a wrap up, maybe this is a good point to just talk about your office hours a little bit. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, I think that's the other thing we didn't mention much, but like, I hate using the word networking, but like yeah. building relationships, like where you can talk to people four or five times in a row and show some work, get some advice, get some notes. Um, I offer thing, it's at um, calendly.com slash otternod. Otternod's my stupid name ever because there's a million people with my name. Um, but you can basically book like 15 minute, half hour, hour long kind of sessions. I have them open up every week. It's a little bit different based on my work schedule, but um, I've probably done, like I said, like five, five or six of these now where we just sit down and we can talk if you've never done animation you want to know what class to take if you want to know what tool to try out if you're working for a little bit and you want someone to look at your reel if you've been working for a while and you want to be full-time somewhere and you don't know how to approach it reach out to me i'm more than happy to talk but you don't have to just like talk to me there are a lot of people out there that are more than willing to kind of give you a little bit of time and build yeah. up that group build up that group of like three or four kind of trusted kind of like um people that can help you get where you want to go well, I think that's super generous of you and and um, amazing. So, well, Ryan, thank you so much for coming on the chat. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've, uh, mm -hmm. you know, love learning about your career and everything motion design. And uh, yeah, I'm super happy we chatted. Right, thanks so much for, for just doing this. Like I said, like it, it's awesome to see you talk to somebody about animation one week and then next <laughs> week talk to somebody who's getting a motion design. And then, you know, like somebody who's running a shop the next week, like the perspective yeah. you offer is like, not like yeah. anybody else that's doing this. So thank you. I appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. And if you're listening and you want to reach out to Ryan or check out his office hours, I'm going to include all the links in the description of this podcast. Again, that's calendly.com slash O-D-D-E-R-N-O-D. And Otternod is his um, Twitter and Instagram as well. And I'll include a link to Spilt as well. So thank you so much for listening. That's all for now. Okay, bye. The music for this podcast was composed by Will Farmer and the graphics by Daniel Abensauer. I encourage you to look them up if you enjoyed their work.